Well, today I want you to be turning back to the book of 1 Chronicles. 1 Chronicles chapter number 16, and we're going to read several verses out of that particular uh, passage there. Now, next week, as we think about uh, the commitments that have come in, are coming in, will continue to come in, we think about that for our building a legacy and having the, uh, our, uh, our time of giving over the next three years uh, for our facilities and the work that has been done, renovations, being a part of this. I'll remind you that next Sunday, the first, will be our 90th anniversary, 90 years Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Were some of you here on that day? <laughs> I'm not saying you looked that way, but I mean just thinking. I don't think we have any charter members uh, probably that are still with us, but thanks be unto God for those first and second generation and those things that were done that bring us to today. We are the benefactors. We are the, the beneficiaries of those things that others have done for us. We sit upon other shoulders, uh, those who have gone before us. Never forget that fact. And so as we think about that next Sunday, what a great day for us to to be thinking about that and our commitments, if you haven't already made that, as we are starting to give toward that already, uh, we are excited. Well, as we look to First um, Chronicles chapter 16, we have uh, the words of David coming forth in praise and this thankfulness here. And so we're going to read those at this time. Would you stand, please, as we honor God's word? First Chronicles chapter number 16. And then we began just reading a portion of that passage, verses 7 through 15. There we find that David is speaking on that day. David first delivered his psalm into the hand of Asaph and his brethren to thank the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing psalms to him. Talk of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the, let the hearts of those who rejoice who seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face forevermore. Remember his marvelous works which he has done. His wonders and the judgments of his mouth. O seed of Israel, his servant, you children of Jacob, his chosen ones. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. Remember his covenant forever, the word which he commanded for a thousand generations. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for how your word now speaks to our hearts. And in these moments that we share it, I pray that we'll all be remembered about the thankful actions that we should have as we think about you, we think about our life, we think about how blessed we are, oh God, I pray that we will be humbled and we will have fresh surrender this day because of who you are, because of who we are in your sight, and the fact that we get to love you and be with you forever. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, we have every reason to thank the Lord in this season, amen? We have every reason to be thankful, so many things that we could probably give thanks for over and over again. And when I think about that, I think about giving thanks. And of course, growing up with, uh, with three sons, we taught them very early to give thanks to the Lord. And even on the blessing, and they took their turn saying the blessing. And even when we went out to eat, they'd like to say the blessing. Well, as we uh, decided to go out one day to the K&W cafeteria, it just so happened to be the week where Josh in his first grade class had studied about Johnny Appleseed. Now, Johnny Appleseed was quite a character, and of course he uh, went about the, uh, the land enjoying uh, the things of the land and planting apple seeds and, and uh, even sharing the good news, but always exp expressing his gratefulness. Never in our minds did we think this blessing was going to be too different from God is great. Until we bowed our heads, and, and uh, who wants to say the blessing? Josh said, I'll say it. And we said, so we bowed our heads, and right in the middle of the K&W, here it comes. Oh, the Lord's been good to me, and so I'll thank the Lord for... <laughs> Forgiving me 
the things I need, the sun and the trees and the apple seed. The Lord's been good to me. And uh, it wasn't quite, uh, <laughs> I should have started that a little lower. I need a pitch pipe on that one. So he wasn't quite that low, but listen, he was every bit that loud. <laughs> and so you say, amen. And uh, you pick your head up and you're looking around and uh, what a time it was. Sometimes we need to be rocked off our, our pedestals, don't we? We need just to have something different than uh, besides just the God is great, God is good. We need to hear what the Lord has in store for us there. So um, <laughs> when I think about that, we think about giving thanks every day. And every day we should be a thankful people. This season ought to be our Super Bowl. It really ought to be. Because we have been so blessed. We can express that in so many ways. And we ought to express that in so many ways as we'll begin to talk about that here in this passage of Scripture today. I really love Thanksgiving probably as much, if not more so, than any other of those holidays that we acknowledge knowledge simply because by and large it is still um, uh, kind of pure unadulterated from the things of this world many people have already begun to get into the things that just quickly pass over just just run over Thanksgiving to get into Christmas and you say well Thanksgiving comes late this year so I got some time to make up for and I've got to do this and this and this and this don't fail to be thankful Remember, it was there in the New Testament we understand that hell will be populated with those who are unthankful. And so it behooves us to give thanks to God each and every day because He has been so good to us. Giving thanks in everything. Now I realize there's still the parades, there's still the football games. If there could be an ad or a commercial to get something more out of Thanksgiving, they're going to give that as well. And I understand the shopping that will take place later this week uh, and, and things that go on like that. But by and large, it's still a time to give thanks. That's why tonight is so special, to set apart a time. Um, whether you eat potato or chili or not is really irrelevant. Whether you give thanks to God is totally important. And to do that publicly is what we should be about. <clears throat> I think I'm going to put a cough drop in and drink some water because I went way too high on that song. <laughs> now we can continue. <clears throat> I'm going to save that. I'm going to save that uh, cough drop just in case. Okay. <clears throat> So we think about everything dealing with thanksgiving. We need to be a people who give thanks. Give thanks for all that God has done for us. Now, we think about that. We look at this passage here in 1 Chronicles. And I want you to be looking at that and going to give you some of the basis of what we're dealing with here because it's, it kind of comes out of nowhere. It, it just appears. And so I want us to look at that. <clears throat> I think I will put it in. Anyway, so um, let's go back hundreds of years, if you will, B.C., before Christ. And we're going to start looking at some of this here that the Lord has, has shown to David. And David just comes out of the, the goodness of his heart. Time and time again, David just, he just seems to explode with, with how good uh, God's been to him. And I think he may have first sang that song, The Lord's Been Good to Me, <laughs> because he did. Remember, he was so happy that his wife chastised him because he danced before the Lord. He dan danced before the Lord because of how blessed he was and how blessed he saw Israel to be. And so he just blessed God over and over again. And when he did that, you know, his wife said, Well, you've made a fool of yourself today. And he said, in what way? Well, you're dancing out there in public for everybody to see. Listen, he said, my heart was pure and I danced before the Lord. It was as if to say, you ought to have joined me. We'd have had a great time. There will always be those who will try to throw cold water on you when you try to do something for the Lord. But the background of this passage, just taking it back, is probably somewhere around 450 B.C., 500 years or 550 after David's reign. 
And this is Asaph who has passed this on down the line and given this particular psalm uh, back to the people here as he is recording that and they are going to be singing it. It gives us a history of God's unwavering faithfulness. Would you say that God's been faithful to you? And ask if you've been faithful to God all the time. But God has been faithful to us, extremely faithful to us in so many ways. So the history is being retold here. The great history that has been told concerning David and Solomon. And then as they attempted to do great things for God. Remember that Israel has been, and and Jerusalem in particular, we, we talked about that and how many times Jerusalem has been destroyed 17 times and built, rebuilt 18 times times all these things that are taking place here uh they 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 know that it has come and has gone it has risen it's fallen as i'm going through some of that old testament reading now the times that god finally said i am going to discipline you i am going to get your attention i'm going to bring you back to myself and if any person here today thinks that If you name the name of the Lord God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and you want to walk in your wayward condition and think you just come back any time, any way you want to, you may find out that there's heartache to pay because God may take you to the woodshed. If he chastened ancient Israel, if he chastened the church in the New Testament, he will chasten us still today. So remember, Jerusalem has been restored. Now we're looking somewhere in that area of about 450 B.C. And you've got to remember that when Nehemiah came back, and we're looking at contemporaries here, Nehemiah uh, was coming back looking, and there was no city. There was no wall. There certainly was no temple that had been there once upon a time. And Ezra, the faithful scribe, is recording these things that needed to be recorded in this particular day. It's with this in mind that the scribe is is hastening back to the time when David is simply saying, Oh God, you have been faithful to us in all of these years. Now, to give you a little bit more of this history, you'll remember the Ark of the Covenant had been stolen by the Philistines. The Philistines were troubled on every side, and so they finally said, we're going to get rid of this thing because it has been nothing but heartache ever since we've had this thing here. And so sure enough, uh, they bring the Ark of the Covenant as far as they could get it as they begin on the road to Kerjath Jerem, and as they were trying to get there, you remember one fellow by the name of Uzzah. Uzzah was the guy who's walking there, and the cart stumbles a little bit. The Ark of the Covenant is shaking, and he puts his hand up to steady the Ark of the Covenant, and bam, he drops dead. Because nobody was to touch the Ark of the Covenant. From that point, they went into a house, they went into a place there, and that's where the Ark would stay for some time. But now they've got to the point to where David has established the city of God. He's established more there in Jerusalem and where it's going to be and what's going to take place. And so they are moving finally the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. And as they bring the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem, there is tremendous celebration when they're arriving in that place. How much so? Well, if you saw the first few verses of chapter 16, it talked about, and they had burnt offerings, they had peace offerings before the Lord, and when they finished the burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord, and he distributed To every one of Israel, both man and woman, to every one a loaf of bread, a piece of meat, and a cake of raisins. So the Baptists were happy here now because there is a wonderful meal. But not only that, Chris, the the choir and the orchestra is getting ready to sing and to play. This is a great celebration, the Ark of the Covenant. Remember, the very essence of the presence of God through the wilderness wanderings in the Old Testament times of sacrifice has now finally come to Jerusalem. 
And so the feast is made, and then the choir and the singers, and they're praising God with the singing, with the stringed instruments and harps, and they made music, and, and there were the cymbals and trumpets and all those kinds of things that were playing there. And so I said, you know, there's one thing about it. When you get the singers, you got the orchestra, we are a biblical church in every way. And we attempt to do that. So when you wonder sometimes about that in this day where, where some are saying, well, we don't need a choir anymore and we don't need an orchestra anymore, I thank God for our choir and our orchestra. I thank God for the worship that takes place there, takes place there and I thank God for their hearts in worship. Thank God for Chris as he leads them in that endeavor. And so they're eating, they're singing, they're hearing the music played. There is great rejoicing. And so that's the background of where he's coming out with this praise. So what does it mean to give thanks? And what are some of these elements? What are some of these actions that we see that David is involved with as he is giving thanks to God that the Ark of the Covenant has finally arrived here in Jerusalem? Well, the first one that we can see, and you'll note on the back of your bulletin we've got a number, so we're going to skip right through these as we go. But first of all, it is thanksgiving. He says in verse 8, O oh, give thanks to the Lord. Now, Thanksgiving is a familiar um, uh, subject to the, uh, the psalmist as they went one psalm after another, dealt with the, uh, the psalms and giving thanks to the Lord. And you remember all those psalms of praise as, as, as God was being given the, the grace, the, uh, thanking him with, with gratitude for what he had done. Uh, you know, and that's what Thanksgiving, by the way, is all about. I think our marquee out front reads in this way. Thanksgiving really is an attitude of gratitude. It's stopping to say, thank you, Lord, so that he doesn't have to read our minds. And by the way, if he's having to stop and read our minds and we haven't stopped long enough to express with our lips, then we, are we really a thankful people? Well, he knows he knows my heart that I really am thankful, though I haven't said it and I haven't expressed it. And, and he knows, does he really? He inhabits the praises of his people. You see, that when we talk about thanksgiving, we could talk about it in a couple different ways. One is a secondary type of thankfulness. This is the thankfulness for the blessings received. You know, like family, friends, health, food. It's a mindset that is thankful for God's great gifts, big and small. Jonathan Edwards said this is a natural gratitude. I would say further, natural gratitude is anybody in their right mind could be thankful for that because that's what it is. And so for, for many people, that doesn't come hard at all to be able to say that. As a matter of fact, this week you'll see many people on parades and football games and other commercials talking about how thankful they are and some will be skirting around in any issue of who they're really thankful to they just tend to be thankful about what they have and that they are blessed but there's also a primary type of appreciation and this is a gracious gratitude not necessarily being thankful for what God gives but rather for who God is his goodness, his mercy, his love, his power, his grace. It's a type of, of, of genuine evidence of the Holy Spirit in a person's life. So it asks us the question today, we ask ourselves the question, are we really a thankful people? To thank God for who he is and for that which he displays to us each and every day, not just for food, not just for health and family and friends, but for who he is and how he's shown up in our lives so many times. Francis Schaeffer once said, the beginning of man's rebellion against God was and is the lack of a thankful heart. If you find yourself thinking that you've done everything for yourself, it's my job, it's my family, it's my house, it's my car, it's my portfolio, and everything is about yours. One day it'll be your casket. It's about you. Then you've missed the mark. Because this ticker right here is controlled by one who can stop it anytime he wants to. And these lungs that breathe this air every day, anything and everything you or I have are because of his goodness and his grace. Being thankful. 
the ten lepers found in Luke 17, a familiar passage this time of year, deals with the fact that, that all ten were healed and they ran to the priest to be declared clean. You're clean now. You don't have to, to go off and to be an outcast. And yet the one started down the road and he returns back and gives thanks to Jesus. And Jesus asking, so where's the nine? How many times have we been in the nine shoes rather than the one? Taking for granted thanksgiving before God. So thanksgiving will be the first action that David is giving thanks. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. And then there's humility. Notice that he says in the first part of verse 8, call upon the name of the Lord. Call upon his name. It, it ought to just again be a natural reaction that we have of any thankful person. But how many times do we first of all have to be in need before we go before God to give thanks to Him? How many times do we have to really say, Oh God, you know I'm in a pinch right now. Oh God, I really need you to come through in this situation. Oh God, I need you to heal this person. Oh God, this is... You know, just to be thankful. Lord, I'm just here to say thank you. Thanks for Calvary. Thanks for loving me. Thank you for being born where I am. Thank you for the family I have. Thank you for the friends. Thank you for our church family. So many things. We think about that and we think about humility is to call upon the Lord. It's not taking it for granted ourselves. Back in the book of James chapter 4 verses 6 through 10, it says, <clears throat> God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Do you know a very practical way to humble yourself before God? A very practical way is to lay flat on the floor and praise God. I realize you may have to have some help getting up. For some of you, it would be kind of dangerous to do that. It could be that you kneel in front of a chair in your house, but that you actually kneel and get yourself in a position to whereby you are humbling yourselves. And if you can get on the floor, just to get on the floor. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, submitting yourself. Now I realize there's always been people who said, well, it's not, the, it's not the posture, position of the body, it's the position of the heart. Many times the heart will, will declare what the position of the body is. So when's the last time you've been a knee before God or fell on your face before Him? God wants us to be people that are humble. Because if, if not, then maybe we're attaching the glory to ourselves. Look what I've done. Look how I did this, or look how I did that. And remember, God said, touch not the glory. Never let it be about you. It's always got to be about him. Humility is an action of a thankful believer. There's a third one. And that is there needs to be witness. The last part of verse 8 says, make known his deeds among the people. Make known his deeds among the people. When you think of that, we think about the witness, that we've been blessed by a bountiful God. It's, it's overwhelming that when Governor Bradford got off with the pilgrims off the ship and they had their first year there and, and, and he talked about how we've been blessed by the Creator and how He has sustained us in our journeys and how He's allowed us to even come forth with the crop. It was stopping to give thanks. Even President Lincoln back in 1863 uh, read his proclamation for a national day of fasting, humiliation, and prayer. And he said, we have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. Would you agree? But when is he saying this if it's in 1863? I'd say it's in the middle of war, wouldn't you? If you know your history. In the middle of the Civil War. He says, we've grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown, but we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us, and we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by superior wisdom and virtue of our own. 
intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace. Too proud to pray to God that made us. It behooves us then to humble ourselves before the offended power. To confess our national sins and to pray for clemency and forgiveness. Does that speak to your heart? That's President Lincoln. Speaking to a people. Whether good times or bad times. A witness. A witness is one who says, when he says here in verse 8, he, he reminds us, make known his deeds among the peoples. It's to be a witness. Do you know this is a tremendous time of year for us to be a witness for our Savior? Now, we've talked about that some on Wednesday nights and even in here. But what greater time for us to say when somebody just asks you that candid question, how you doing? How about and say, uh, instead of, all right, all right. You okay? Yeah, okay. That's, that's a winner. Listen, how about, I'm blessed. I am blessed. We're coming back through K&W last night on the way back up the road. I didn't sing, um, just for the record. But we came back through there, and the man was back there. He said, you know, we're, just, we're blessed. And, and uh, he says, we're, we, uh, you know, we've been given a lot as God's children, you know, and all that. I said, yeah, we are. He didn't say blessed. I did. And so I wanted to get him going. And uh, I, so I said, man, we are so blessed. Yes, we are. We're blessed. You know, you may be a blessing to somebody else who then will in turn bless your heart simply because you did something that wasn't about yourself. They're expecting you to say, okay, or been a tough day, or I've been better, or the normal, normal, normals. But what about this time of year for even the children of God, even going through difficult times because they know no month, nor week, nor day to say, I'm blessed. Or, you know... God's been so good to me. You're at least planting the seed whether their comeback is anything or not. But we've been, we've been so trained in the last decade or so to be so tolerant. That would be way too Christian for what people need to hear. How about being a witness and make known his deeds to all the people? That's what he says here. So I'm going to charge you to make yourself very proactive and use every opportunity over the next five and six weeks as we begin to go through this season to think about your responses to other people, to think about what you're going to say to other people, and to do it in a very positive way, but to engage them, which may lead to an opportunity to even go further in spiritual things. You know what they may say then? Wow, you know, you're pretty good. You, you must go to church. Where do you go to church? You may have a chance to go further than you thought. If you'll get off the regular answers, you use 11 other months out of the year. And maybe what if we did that all through the year instead of just this time of the year? He goes further in verse 9, the last part, he says, Talk of his wondrous works. We should be the first to give God the credit for what he's done, for how he's blessed us. Talk of his wondrous works. Can I tell you what God did? Not, well, you know, it just sort of happened. It, coincidentally, all those kinds of things that we just put God completely out of the picture, we don't have to explain it. We just have to give him glory. You know, God moved in this way. God did this. Talk of his wondrous works. How are you? And listen, I want to charge you further than that. When you have your family get-togethers with your family, have them to say what they're thankful for. And to go beyond the normal, I'm thankful for family. You might want to rule certain things out. I've been there in those situations. What are you thankful for? Family, 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 family. All right, I guess we can pray and eat. You mean we got to do that before we eat? <laughs> What's the most important thing about being thankful? And just share. And we ought to be able to share a lot of things, and other people maybe would share some of those things too instead of getting hung up on the same answers all the time so he's talking about how we should talk of his wondrous works how blessed he's been how good he's been to us how he's raised us up on beds of affliction how he saw us through very difficult situations 
You know, you can't always count on, on family and friends. You can't always count on anybody else, but you can always count on the Lord. So let his works be known. Give God the glory here is what he's really talking about. You know, Christmas is really a, a season of the soul as we prepare to go into that from Thanksgiving. And it's an opportunity to talk of his wondrous works. You know, especially when people want to throw out the happy holidays to you. Turn that around. Or maybe start out by wishing them a Merry Christmas. A blessed Christmas. Use those kinds. Now, I'm not talking about just antics to use but I'm saying we can do more than we're doing we've dumbed ourselves down to where we we're not even giving God the credit for what he's done you know we began to talk about the gospel praise God for Jesus coming to be our Savior There's a fourth word, and that is worship. Notice verse 9, verse, first part. Sing to him. Sing songs to him. Verse 23 says to sing to the Lord all the earth. Who should sing? The redeemed. You say, not if you heard me sing. When you're by yourself, sing to the Lord. When you're riding in your car, when you're around other people, at least mouth the words. Sing to the Lord. Make a joyful noise to the Lord. And that's what he's reminding over and over again. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all ye lands. I will sing of the mercy and justice to you, O Lord. I will sing praises. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. So let me ask you, how's your worship? Do you worship him, or do you have to be in a worship service to worship him? Sometimes you can just have a fit going down the road. Not because of drivers, but you can have a fit with God going down the road. Just think about it. Who he is and what he has done for you. As all of heaven's in constant worship of God, we need to remember that he inhabits the praises of his people and to praise him. Oh, come let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. An action of a thankful heart is worship. But there's a fifth one, and that is honor. Verse 10, glory in his holy name. Verse 29, give to the Lord the glory due his name. When you honor someone, what do you think you're doing? You're kind of in reverence of that particular person. Are you revering God, knowing who he is and really who you are when you think of that? So if you're reverencing God, would you say you're honoring God? Do your words, do your actions honor God? The way that you respond to others, the witness that you are, are you honoring him for who he is in your life or is it just that best kept secret that you just can't get out to share with anybody if we're a thankful person and David didn't care he was getting it out whatever come what may he was praising the Lord now, there's another one that we that comes to our mind verse 6 here verse or excuse me number 6 is in verse 11 and that is the action of pursuit to pursue God Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face forevermore. Psalm 42 says, Even as the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my heart for you, O God. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. It's a matter of seeking after him. Not when you get to an impasse. Not when you get to a place that you don't know what else you're going to do. I've done everything else. I better pray. No, seek the Lord first. That's the thankful heart. Seek his face and seek him with prayer. Seek him with hearing a word from him. There's another word here, and it's the seventh one. That's to meditate. Verses 12a and following. Remember his marvelous works which he has done. His marvelous works, I think of that song, Count Your Many Blessings. Great things he had taught us, great things he has done. Over and over again, he has reminded us of that. To reflect, to remember all he has done. When I think of the word meditate, I think of going by a pasture and seeing the old cow chewing its cud. And it's as if that cow's just going, yep, yep. 
God's been good to me. It's just to meditate over and over again. Oh, God, you've done this. You came through in this situation. Lord, you did this this week. And just to notice him every week, we sometimes just don't even notice all that he is doing and doing for us. Meditate upon him. The psalmist knew that these marvelous works, these mighty works were of a God who cared for them. As a matter of fact, he's the one who gave them Old Testament victory there in the Old Testament, the victory over the Egyptians and got them out to freedom. He's the one who had gave them the, the, the victory over the enemy countries that were coming against them. He promoted Joseph from prison to prime minister. He led Daniel to that place that we're looking at on Wednesday night from from being a, a stranger in the land to next to the king himself. He's the God who supplied the need of Elijah when he took on 450 prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. That, those are the acts, the mighty works of God. So many miracles. But as believers, we know the greatest work of God. You know the greatest miracle of all? That he saved our soul. May we never get over, there should never be a day that we don't thank God for our salvation. The greatest of all miracles is that he saved our soul. That great incarnation, God coming to this earth, being taken on human flesh as the God-man in order to live a perfect life and to teach us all about himself, but then to die on the cross as the sacrifice for all of our sins. And not to stay dead, but to be raised the third day victoriously. You see, we have so many reasons to be thankful. His great works, his work of salvation and redemption. Three more words quickly. First one is reflect in verse 12. Reflect upon his wonders. The heavens declare the handiwork of God. And we'll give you one. You know, the, they're still trying to figure out how deep and how big and how wide this universe is. And the other universes, can I remind you in Psalm 147, verse 4, when people are trying to do away with God ever knowing anything or creating anything at all, that he has numbered the stars and that he knows them by name. Now that'll blow your mind. First thought is, looks like he'd kind of run out of names after a while. After you get past the first million and billion, you know, it just looks like it. Reflect upon who he is, his wonders as the heavens declare the handiwork of God. The ninth word is to consider, verse 14, his judgments are in all the earth. You know, he would use the Egyptians and then he would cast them down. He would use the Babylonians to get Israel and then he would take care of them. Because God's trying to, to take care of the judgment at hand and whatever it would take to chasten the people, that's exactly what he did over and over again. And we have that picture in the New Testament. As Hebrews says, to despise not the chastening of the Lord. But consider that ultimate judgment on the cross when Jesus judged sin for all time. Consider his judgments. And then as the choir sang that great song, I will remember, the last one is remember. Verse 15, remember his covenant forever. The covenant, the, the word which he commanded for a thousand generations. He spoke it to Abraham. Before he ever spoke it to Abraham, he had spoke it there in Eden. He had spoke it to Adam. And he continued through Noah. But he did speak it to David even after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he went on further and he spoke it to David. He had spoke it to Samuel. And, and, and we keep going further and further, that judgment, ultimately the covenant of the new covenant. And the new covenant is what we're concerned with there in the New Testament because of what it speaks to us. That new covenant states that it's the new covenant of his blood. Remember, that's his last words. Take and drink this blood of the new covenant which is shed for you. A new covenant that Hebrews talks about. That our sins could be forgiven because of his shed blood on the cross. And all, for, for as many as received him, to, to them he gave the right to be called the sons and daughters of God. The, the, the fact that he said that as many as, as believed him because he said, my sheep, 
hear my voice and they know me. And he says, they will follow me and I'm going to give them eternal life and they'll never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. So when we think about remembering, we have to remember. Remember our salvation if it's taken place. If not, then we need to have a time where Jesus actually becomes our Savior. Maybe today that he becomes our Lord. Perhaps this is a day we've been reminded that we, we don't near thank God enough for what he's done. We don't near thank him enough for who he is and how he's always been faithful to his covenants and how he's going to keep us and sustain us. And that which has been committed unto him will be there in that day of judgment. How about in your life today? It's one thing to say we're thankful. It's another thing to have the actions that prove that thankfulness. David spoke that, but he also had the actions to prove that. How about your life today? Will this truly be a thanksgiving to remember? Because you're going to choose to be more thankful than you've ever been in your life. That your words are going to declare the things that you're thankful for. That you're going to say to other people how thankful you are, how blessed you are, and use it as a time of witness. It even spreads into Christmas time. When we give thanks, not only with just our lips, but our actions, everything that we are, we give thanks to the creator, sustainer of this life. As we've been looking at that list of the actions of which we can be a part of in giving thanks to God, how thankful are each of us? How much praise and thanksgiving and gratitude flows from our hearts? We really can't answer for anybody else, but we can answer for ourselves. I hope and pray that this will be a moment when you reflect upon how good God has been to you, how much he's revealed himself to you, and how he truly loves you even through the giving of his only son for our sins on the cross. Perhaps today you need to give thanks to God for the Lord Jesus Christ. Every believer should certainly do that every day, but I'm talking to you who have never had a personal born-again experience with Christ. You may be wondering about that today, and this could be your day of salvation. So we're going to pray, and I'm going to lead you through a simple prayer as you pray your heart back to God and you respond to Him at this time with this particular type of prayer that asks Christ to be your Savior. Would you pray with me? And Father, right now I come to you on behalf of many that are watching the broadcast today. And I pray in particular for those whose hearts are, are being drawn toward you. Your Holy Spirit's been working today. And I know they're extremely thankful for how good you've been to them and all that you've done for them in their life and that you've brought them to this particular moment and this particular message to this particular time of decision. And so I pray that you would give them the grace now just to respond to you and your great love by thanking you for Jesus and the cross. Lord, as they would ask Christ to come in to be their Savior, to trust his sacrifice for their sins, would you help them to pray a prayer much like this to you? Dear God, I thank you for loving me, and I thank you for loving me in spite of my sin. Please forgive me of my sin. And forgive me of that sin that nailed Jesus to the cross. Come into my life. Be my Savior, my Lord, from this day forth. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Father, I pray for others today who maybe need to draw closer to you for a closer walk during this time. Lord, I pray this will be the day that we do not take you for granted, that we do not fly into the Christmas season without giving you thanks. It may be even in our family situations this week to lead others in a time of thanksgiving and not just a meal, not just a happy gathering, not just a family get-together, but we'll talk about how you have blessed us, especially with Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you again for watching the broadcast today, and I pray that you'll be blessed during this Thanksgiving season. Be thankful unto him. That's what he wants us to do, and we ought to enter his courts with praise. As we prepare now to enter into the Christmas season, may that Thanksgiving still be there. May our hearts be full of praise, and may that be shown through our actions toward others. God bless you. Have a good and a godly week. If you would like to help support ministry at West Asheville Baptist Church, you can do so by visiting our website, westashevillebaptist.org, to give online, or by calling the church office at 
9824.